All right, I'm going to share my window here. Let's see. All right, um, everyone should be able to see the Caltrap uh, application. I'm going to hide my bookmarks bar, clean up the screen a little bit here. All right, so I'm going to just dive right in here, uh, folks. Um, we have a lot of people on the call today. Um, I definitely haven't met um, um, nearly nearly any of the people on the team, uh, but welcome. My name is Kevin Penner. I'm the uh, technical lead for the Caltrap project on the Vertigis side. Um, what we've been able to do here is um, build off of the current application, um, which is comprised of two components. So we have the uh, county administrator side, and then we have the per county um, trapper and inspecting application that is used on um, uh, iPads. So today we're going to focus on going through the functionality um, on the administrative side. Now, these actions will need to be performed by the administrative team in each county before trapping can be successfully uh, started. Um, so, so this is a prerequisite before the programs can begin in the field. Um, what can I say here? So, um, first of all, I'd like to just uh, show the process of arriving to the application. So, this application is inside of um, LA's environment. So, Tom uh, has set up uh, through ISD, the ISD group, the environment where all of these applications are, are going to live. And, and the way that we're going to partition the applications is, is per county. So don't expect to see other data um, mixed in. You will be delivered an application that focuses on your county, has your users in it, your trapping data. Um, and at a higher level, at the CDFA level, um, it would be possible to combine some of these data sets um, but um, for, for management purposes, it's going to be all separate and all siloed um, um, off by itself. So the first thing that everyone needs to know is how to sign into the application. So um, it's outside of the scope of this discussion today about what your username is going to be, your username and password. This is going to be managed by the um, either the ISD team or through uh, CDFA and, and and as all the different counties gets get their apps spooled up, you'll also get your username um, um, and sign in information for yourselves and, and for the um, uh, staff within your um, county as well. So what I'm looking at here is a gate to the application, the security sign on gate. So we're using a platform called ArcGIS, um, and this ArcGIS platform has uh, um, sign-ins. So these are ArcGIS identities is what we call them. Um, now, this is, this is a centrally managed system that spans all the counties. So you cannot have the same username. Um, every user will get a unique user ID. To sign into the application, um, if you you know arrive via a, a hyperlink, you'll have to put in your um, your sign in here. Now we're Vertigis, so we're the company that builds on top of the ArcGIS platform, and we've um, extended the ArcGIS platform with some of our software, and and that's called GeoCortex. So right now we're going to be looking at the GeoCortex viewer for HTML5. This is the online portion of the application. So I can type in my uh, user ID that I've been given. I am an administrative user, so I have the ability to do a number of things that that other users might not be able to do, um, users of, of a lower level. Now, we have documentation that will show a matrix of what users can do, what permissions they have, uh, and that's mostly for the administrative side. The trappers, once you're in the uh, offline application, that application is really focused around the trapping uh, and detection activities. So um, there, there aren't really any permission based tools in there. So I'm going to go ahead and sign in. And uh, let's see. I'm 
going to go ahead and sign in um, and we're greeted with a, a splash screen while the application loads. Um, the application itself is going to look the same for everyone except the one difference is going to be the actual content of, of the map. So I want to just go through and talk about the basic components of this application first. And and what kind of tools and methodologies uh, we've built and used to uh, meet the requirements that were put forward by um, the LA group and the and CDFA. So on the map itself, uh, we're going to show your county at a zoomed out level so you can kind of get an overview of everything. The red outlines that we see here are station boundaries. So station is a very important concept. It's possible that your county only has one station. Uh, in some of the heavily populated or larger counties, there could be multiple. In the case of LA, there's five stations. We have north, west, central, south, and east. Within those stations, we see these grid lines. Uh, these are the one by one mile grids. And as we zoom in closer, we're going to actually see that inside of those grids are multiple different subgrid systems. So we've built this app to be extensible so it can support multiple different subgrid formats for different um, trapping activities such as quints, three by three, four by four, five by five, and whatever else might come out in the future. So this application has the has the, the power to be flexible. Um, I'm just checking the chat here to see if okay. If we have okay, good. Um, so as I zoom in, uh, oh, I should explain that these are routes here. That these purple outlines. We have 19-46. We have another one here, and we have 19-33. This is testing data that uh, my team has put into the application. Um, as a way to verify that all the functions were working post delivery. So, um, you know, I, I presume that this will all be scrubbed after the user acceptance testing program uh, uh, and process. And that's when the real, uh, you know, the, the, the real trapping data will be put in here. So we can see a route, as I said, has this purple outline. It has a label. The route name is the label. And then inside we have some different colored blocks. Uh, those different colored blocks are books. And as I zoom in further here, we're going to see like different levels of detail coming up in the application. So the application at this point, it looks quite busy. So what we're looking at is all the different subgrids laid on top of one another. It's not really that important at this step to you know, differ differentiate between the different subgrids. In the trappers application, they will only see the subgrid that is pertinent to the route that they're working on. So if they need to see quince, they'll only see quince. If they need to see five by five, they'll only see five by five. The route is broken up into different books and the books are indicated by the different colored uh, sections on the screen here. So this is configurable and you know we're expecting through the UAT process that some of these things are going to be tweaked and maybe the colors is something that gets tweaked. So I know that that these two colors here are quite similar and we want to make sure that um, you know individuals who maybe can't discern between the different colors so well um, we can we can find a nice mix for uh, the different books. Um, so a route is a very important concept. Um, pre now, is there trapping data in 19-33? I'm going to zoom in a little bit here and see. Uh, uh, there wouldn't be in 19-33. Okay, which which uh, one has uh, trapping data? There's one in the north. Okay. Sorry, I'm getting a bit of feedback. Okay. I'm going to go find a route that has some trapping data, and we're going to zoom in further on the map, and we're going to just see some additional information. And I want to just explain the map first and, and give everyone an overview of you know what they're seeing because the map is such an important tool um, in this application. So previously we'll have it. Okay, so, so here we can see. Um, I think this might be two routes. This might be two routes here side by side. Um, all right.
OK, so um, I've zoomed in on a route here and what we can see uh, are some different colored um, indicators. So these are actually traps. So the the um, different colored shapes indicate Jackson, McPhail, or we have uh, other traps as well, which are these uh, circle ones. And the color is important um, um, uh, for in the application for a number of reasons. So when you look at a trap, now this, you're not meant to go out and service traps with this application. This is merely a dashboard for understanding what's going on um, inside of the different routes. Um, green means that this trap is, uh, 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 you know, the trap has been placed. Uh, the trap is uh, collecting pests and uh, it does not need service and it has not been skipped. So the, the, the inspector for whatever purpose has not had to skip this trap. Uh, orange trap would indicate that the inspector has come, but were, was unable to service the trap for whatever reason. So we have a couple orange ones on, on the map, uh, or, or sorry, pre oranges need service, right? Yes, that's, yes right. that's right. Okay, my, my mistake. So when a trap is needing service, it's put into an orange state. So we were we were working on how to visualize the traps in the different states. Um, orange means that something must be done to this trap. Um, it, one of its validation flags has been triggered, and the inspector will be able to go out and perform those uh, um, activities based on the state of the trap. Uh, red, which I'm not sure if we have any red, means that the inspector was unable to service the trap. So you'd see a red, uh, a red triangle um, uh, or a red trap shape when that trap was skipped. And that indicates that, you know, something needed to be done, but the inspector was unable to get there. And there's a number of different reasons why an inspector may not be able to get there. As you all know, maybe there's a dog in the yard, um, nasty, nasty old dog or something like that. And it, it's, it's a real uh, visual indicator that something needs to be happen. Uh, something needs to happen here. I see a hand up. Um, uh, let me see, who was that? Did someone put up their hand? Yeah, David Neustadt. Hey, David. Hi. Hi. Um, for the uh, trap changing to orange, when does it do that? So if a trap is on a bi-weekly service schedule, at what point does it, uh, is it determined that it is due for some kind of activity? Okay, so. After it's been service, uh, when it hits the two-week mark, at some point before this is going to be All right, so David, uh, your your mic was quite um, uh, quiet, but I think the question was, and just correct me, uh, you know, if I get this right, and that's basically you you were asking when does the symbology on the map change? What triggers that change? Correct. Okay, so every night we have a job that's going to run in the background, uh, and it runs. Could run at midnight, could run at 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. There's a lot of data to go through, but what it does is it looks at the trap and it says, all right, what survey was this trap placed for? So was it the med fly? And what trapping parameters go along with that survey? So what are the service intervals? And then it checks the date. Okay, this trap was placed on this date and it was last serviced on this date. What are the parameters? Okay, it's two weeks. Well, we're actually two weeks and one day now, so that is going to trigger the change. So in the morning, the application, when everyone arrives at the office and takes their uh, iPads and, and, and you know, I'll get into what that process looks like tomorrow, the, the trap statuses are gonna be updated for everyone. So it rolls over every night and we experimented with, okay, should this happen in real time? what's the best way to do this? And, and running a, a job on the database was by far the most efficient way um, to, to perform this, this type of operation on thousands of traps. Well, so if, if a trap is due to be serviced every two weeks and orange indicates that something needs to be done, 
done. Should we yeah. change orange on the day that it's due? So that because if it shows green on the day that it's due, then somebody might say, well, nothing needs to be done here. So we built the app in a way that it will appear orange on the day that it, something needs to be done. So okay. if, you, if you perform an activity at 4 p.m., well, in two weeks, it'll be due on the morning of that day. So it doesn't wait till, for example, 4 p.m. or anything like that. It so, it it rounds it, it rounds down to the to the nearest morning, essentially. OK, so it, it'll be due. Oh. Before they would start work on the day that exactly it would show only show the day after. Yeah, and again, again, your mic was quite uh, silent, but yes, we did um, specifically work around that case. Is how should those um, traps be handled? And we we you know we learned a lot from the working group. So there's a core group. Uh, from the CDFA and LA County that we've been working with um, throughout this, and and everything we all the decisions were were made in um, uh, you know consultation uh, with the with the working group. So, um, in a real trapping scenario, the map there would be quite a few more traps here, as we all know. Um, you know there there could be you know sixty or seventy traps in a route or even more, um, depending on the on the density of the location that's being trapped. So I've gone over traps. Um, I'm going to quickly discuss the blue lines. So the blue lines indicate where there is a merged quint. Now merged quint merging uh, is done by um, administrative staff, and this basically is making exceptions where there might not be uh, acceptable trapping sites or hosts. So uh, an area, maybe, you know, there's a big highway or a large water reservoir or something like that, that we need to, you know, in order so so we don't flag, you know, uh, a, a, a quint as needing traps, it must be merged. So that's a tool that I'm going to get into uh, this morning as well is, is grid management. Um, and we can, we can merge quints and we can also merge grids so one by one mile grids can be merged as well uh, okay i'm going to zoom in further here and this is really the the working level this is the working level of the the trapping staff um, out in the field and this is the sites the host and the trap level so this is this is like at the street level how are they going to be interacting with the application? So down here, um, we're going to have parcel data. So these orange outlines here, uh, this is parcel data, and this is supplied um, by each county, uh, and it's it's base data. So in order to trap somewhere, um, perform trapping activity somewhere, we must make it a site. So it must be a site. We need to collect information, contact information, um, permission. Maybe we need to write down some notes about the trapping site and things like, does the site have a dog, for example? So um, here, these, these yellow boxes are trapping sites that um, can now hold hosts, which I know that there's different nomenclature, but a host would be a tree. So somewhere or a tree or a fence post or somewhere that you can uh, deploy a trap to. So these dots are the um, the trapping hosts. So um, our application, I just want to mention, is very data driven. So if you have, you know, some of you, I don't know how far reaching this group is, but some of you may have different pests in your county than other counties. Some of you ha may have different hosts. Some of you may have different um, um, service intervals. Um, this application, we built it in a way that that allows the administrator uh, and the um, ISD t uh, team who's managing the uh, infrastructure and the, and the actual applications to perform 
to enter all that stuff in the application. So um, in, nothing is hard coded, if you will. It's very configuration driven. Um, you know, we're going to be working with Bonnie to be collecting, you know, all the data like from each county and then putting it into the application. So so those counties can go out um, um, and perform their activities based on their own parameters. And that includes different subgrid types as well. We're looking at a lot of different subgrid types here for some counties. Maybe you only use one. Your, then your application, we can set it up to only have one. So uh, you're kind of looking at the this is the real superset. This is this has got everything in it because we want to make sure we do a really thorough test um, and and set up something for UAT that's that's really solid here. Um, all right, so we can see down here that there is a trap deployed to a host here. So I've gone over the map. Um, it's very important that everyone understands um, the map and what they see. And now I think we can get into um, a few more of the tools. And and you know we do have another hour and a half. Um, I think that's going to be just the right amount of time. Um, a couple quick questions is probably okay as we go through, but we'll I'll keep an eye on the time to make sure that um, we can get through all the content today. Uh, and, and you know we can gladly have a follow up session for questions, clarifications, and and anything like that. Um, and I'll work with um, um, uh, most likely Bonnie on setting uh, that up. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit here, and um, I guess what I'm going to do first is I'm going to do some user management. So having users in the application and having users set up in an accurate fashion is kind of one of the one of the ground uh, uh, one of the ground pieces here. The uh, you know we need to have users that are going to use the application. That includes administrative users. That includes uh, inspectors, trappers, supervisors, um, all these different types of users. And for that. So our application uh, has a couple different regions. We've got the map, of course. Um, we also have the toolbar up top. So there's a few different tabs. We've got the survey tab, and this is for doing things related to setting up surveys and routes. We've got an assignment tab, which is like assigning and managing vehicles, assigning routes, managing users. We've got navigation, which is which is mostly map uh, centric tools and we've got some reporting as well. So on the assignment tab, um, we can click on manage users and what we're going to get here is a uh, control panel of different user based tools. So at, depending on what type of user you are, you will see some different options here. So administrative users, will have the add user capability. So there's two ways that new users can be created. If I'm an administrator, I can come in and add a user um, by default. If, uh, if a, a user visits the application and they're a new user, there's going, going to be a form that shows up on their first visit and it says, identify yourself, who are you? Type some information about yourself. And then supervisors and, admin and, and administrative users can then go in and approve that user who's new coming into the application. So you can review all the details about the user, you can make edits to them, uh, and then you can approve them uh, and grant them access to the application. So that could be really handy. For example, I'm, um, uh, uh, I'm a supervisor, or an administrator at a, at a Napa County, for example, and someone from the CDFA visits my application and they request access. So they request to join and they can put in some details about themselves and then they come in. So everyone will manage their own pool uh, of users and uh, for those people who can access their county's applications. Um, I'm going to go so ahead and just, Kevin, yeah. And this is Bonnie, just a quick question. Yeah. Under what conditions would that form appear for a new user to submit a request? Is it automatic at the first time they navigate there? 
Yeah, so the first time they navigate to the application, uh, Preet, would you be able to um, set up a quick case for that so I can I can demonstrate that? Yes, uh, we do have credentials for a user who's not registered. I can oh. pass that on to you. Okay, that's that's terrific. Uh, if you tell me which user it is on my um, OneNote, okay. I can. So go. you can use Maxis user. Oh, okay. All right. So what I'll do, uh, Bonnie, this is a great time to actually demonstrate that. So, um, okay. what, for example. All right, are you guys looking at an incognito window right now? Or are you still looking at the other application? We still see Caltrap. OK, I'm just uh, putting in another username and password here on my other screen, and then I'll, I'll flip the um, view over so we can see what a new user accessing the application for the first time will look like. All right, bear with me for a moment here, please. So I've come to the application as a different user. I have never been admitted into this application yet, and this is a one-time process. So this happens the first time you visit an app, you, you visit a new application or a new county site that you haven't been to before. As an administrator, so on my other screen, I can approve or reject this user. I can also edit this user, and at any time, I can remove the user, so I can revoke their access from the application as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put in some um, details about myself. This is this user ID and email are associated uh, with Max. So um, as a prerequisite, everyone needs first of all a master login for that for the for the initial page. So you need an ArcGIS identity, which will be um, uh, assigned to you. And then from there, you can use that ArcGIS identity to sign into the different counties' applications. And the you know 95% of the time, you're going to be signing into your own county's application. But if you're CDFA or someone uh, who has who wants to see other counties' data, you will um, be able to sign in there. So I get to put in some information about myself. Um, so I get to say I'm a manager for the whole county. I'm going to go ahead and send this request. And now what happens is the application says you've requested access and my permission uh, request is pending and it's going to kick me out. So until I get approved, I can't get into the application and I can't I can't interact with it or view the data. So when I go back to my other screen, OK, so I go back to my other screen. Uh, you can see here, right? Um, I can now use my approved permissions tool. And I can see the user who has uh, requested access to my application. So I can open this up. I cannot change the user ID or the email. These come from the, that master log and that master ArcGIS um, uh, username password that you have and I can say well this isn't this isn't Kevin Penner this is this is Max and um, this is a proper uh, employee ID and I can change some other details here and then admit them into the application so I can approve and now uh, Max is, is approved to my application to my county's app, he can now visit it and come in at, at the permission level that I set him at. So uh, I set him as a manager. I we will, as part of the documentation, be giving 
a matrix, as I said earlier, of what the different users can do. And a lot of the big ones come down to who can add and revoke users, and then also who can do tasks like um, assigning routes, managing vehicles, and things like that. Those are supervisor level things. Of course, managers can do everything and administrators can do everything as well. So there's a bit of user hierarchy. As an admin supervisor, I can also come in here and start typing in IDs. So I can say, okay, I know that Bonnie wants access to my application. So instead of having Bonnie visit the application and do a permissions request herself, I can go in and, and do this basically, you know, with a, with a free form uh, uh, field here. Now, these user IDs, so this is generated using an autocomplete. You'll start typing the user's name and then you'll see it. You have to select it. This is that master. This is that master login uh, ID. You you can't, for example, you know, um, change anything in here. It it won't save. It will reject that edit. It will say there's no user in the master system that matches um, that format. You have to match the format exactly. You can go through here and and fill out the information. Um, you can modify users. So, for example, we need to move an inspector from one station to another. We need to elevate someone to a supervisor. Hey, congratulations, you got a promotion. You can come into the manage users tool. And we've we know that there's going to be a lot of users for some of the counties. Um, there is a auto or I'm sorry, there is a filter tool here. So you can come in. You're going to see the users for your county and you can start typing. And then you can say, OK, here's Max. Um, I want to change some information about Max. Um, um, you know, you have the freedom to do that here as well. So, um, you know, promoting individuals or moving individuals around um, is, a, is a typical kind of use case for that tool. Uh, there's the remove user tool. So this user no longer has access, should no longer have access to the application. You can come in uh, and complete that operation this way. Alternatively, if someone leaves the organization, um, that user can be deleted from the master uh, um, um, log. Their ArcGIS uh, identity can just be deleted, and that's, an, that's a system administrative um, task, so they can remove that user. But this is a, is, is a short circuit. It doesn't remove their master user, but it removes that person from accessing, having access to your application. So you can perform that immediately when you need to make a change. You do that immediately, then that user won't be able to, um, you know, come in and, and uh, um, you know, change things or, or, or do whatever, right? So it just gives that flexibility to the administrative staff to perform different operations to um, the users here. Um, Here's, here's our, our layer list. So um, this tool can be accessed um, through the I want to menu, uh, change vis visible map layers. And if you want, you can hide things um, to stylize the map different. I, I should have covered that earlier when we were talking about the map. But um, this is a nice tool that you know just allows you to clean up the view a little bit, uh, depending on what you want to see. A lot of the layers, they really need to be on to effectively uh, um, administer the application. So we have everything pretty much turned on by default the way that you know we think makes the most sense. But hey, if you don't want to see subgrids, you don't have to see subgrids. Um, you, you can you can come and clean up uh, uh, the map as you see fit. So I'm going to leave those on for now. Um, so we have users. Let's jump over to a tool called Managed Vehicles. This is for assigning vehicles and adding vehicles, adding fleet vehicles. So and this is another thing. You, you can't have um, uh, inspectors going out without having a vehicle assigned to them. Um, the application, when they are going to start work, will ask them, what vehicle are you in? Most of the time, we foresee that they're assigned to one vehicle. They could be, uh, um, they could be assigned to multiple vehicles, but um, 
Um, the app, you know, we need to track odometer readings, track vehicle use and things like that. So um, adding vehicles is pretty straightforward. You get a form here and you get to fill out some details about the vehicle. So license plate, vehicle ID. Now this vehicle ID field, this is this is whatever IDs that that you use in the real world to track your vehicles. Um, we have some make, model, year information, as well as starting odometer. So this will be kind of like a one-time setup and then ongoing maintenance to maintain your, your vehicle fleet in the application. I know you guys aren't trapping with uh, VW buses. Uh, we can enter in a vehicle here and we can also um, uh, pick what station office it's working for. So uh, LA County has a lot of stations. This is a really good uh, um, place to test on, but um, I'll create a vehicle in the central station. I can then go and assign that vehicle out. So um, I can search for that vehicle. We have a lot of vehicles. Oh, this one. And then what I can do is in here, again, when I assign a vehicle, I can search for a user and I can ass assign a vehicle to that user. I can modify vehicles and I can remove vehicles. I won't go into too much depth here. And I think, you know what, we, we've created a lot of testing data here, um, um, but that, um, that ID, that vehicle ID is a pretty important tag that you can use um, to search things. And, and, you know, we're gonna collect some feedback from these tools from the UAT, uh, uh, the UAT team, and we're gonna learn, you know, how you know how to best display things in this field and things like that but you can hey, come in you can come in. yeah oh i was oh, just I was gonna, gonna add, add the station drop down doesn't really come through the screen share but for everyone uh there is a drop down that shows all the different stations oh right so right okay drop downs do not show very well on screen share is that right Preet? yeah unfortunately this one doesn't uh, come through Oh, OK, so when I click on station, there's actually I see all the different stations in a list and then I can pick one. Um, and uh, yeah, so so uh, I can update a vehicle there and there are a number of drop downs in this application that might get obfuscated from the demo. I apologize for that. So modify vehicle and we can also remove vehicle. So I can't remove a vehicle if it's assigned to someone or I can, uh, but I get a warning. So um, it's just letting me know that this vehicle is currently assigned uh, to this user. Are you sure you want to remove it? So we can uh, remove that vehicle from the list. Um, all right, so let's get into some uh, interesting stuff here around surveys. So we have, we have stations, we have our grids, we have our subgrids. Um, you know, I might go to that change visible map layers and just turn off the subgrids layer. That's quite a um, quite a noisy layer to look at. So this is a, this is a little bit uh, easier to see here. And I'm gonna do uh, I'm gonna create a route down in the east. Uh, I'll do west. I'll do uh, um, this neighborhood here. So um, we're going to go to the surveys tab on the toolbar where you see a whole different array of tools. So creating a survey, this is where we are entering in the detection parameters for a specific pest. So I'm going to cre create a sur uh, click create survey. <laughs> Pardon me. And what I have here is a drop down that you can't see but I can pick from, I can create a survey for the whole county, the, a station, 
or I can create a survey for individual grids. I'm going to create a survey for a station and depending on your user, what level of user you are and what station you're assigned to, Preet, uh, some users, for example, if I'm a supervisor in the West, I can only create surveys for the West. Is that true? That is right. OK, so this uh, is a mechanism with a user management that just keeps you know, users to their own working areas. Now, if I have to do something whole county, you're going to need an administrator to set up those surveys for the whole county. So a supervisor for the West field office, for example, would not be able to do that. You need to uh, you need someone with whole county permissions to do that. And and I guess pre that could actually be a supervisor who has permission to countywide. Is that right? Yeah, we can make some match uh, between different roles and stations. Right, OK. So I've set up this. This is an administrative user, so I pretty much have the sledgehammer of power. I can do whatever I want um, here. And I get to select my station. So there's this button here after I do the um, drop down. The application will respond in different ways. So if I have the option to pick whole county and the whole county is turned yellow, um, if I click the station from the drop down, then I can click on just one station. I can clear that. I could select a new one if I want. And if I do the grid option, I can select individual grids. Now, I don't know if this scenario is commonly used. I could see this being more of a delimitation um, um, type method to create a survey. but. Deli full delimitation feature that's for um, the next phase, but this is kind of like a gateway to some of that um, behavior here. So as I said, I want to pick station and I'm going to hit the next button. Uh, and now what I get to do is add or, or I'm going to create a survey, but it needs to be part of a survey set or a survey group. Now this is an interesting concept. Um, I'm not sure how familiar um, the whole uh, audience is with this concept, but when I create a route for a trapper or an inspector to go out and, and perform detection activities on, that route corresponds to a group of surveys or a survey set. Because when I go out on my route, I'm trapping for Mediterranean fruit fly, uh, oriental fruit fly, melon fly, Japanese beetle, gypsy moth. So that would be five surveys in one survey set. And then I say this route, this route, this area I've picked correlates to this survey set. And then in the trapping application, it knows, OK, today you're going out and you're doing book two and you're trapping for these different types of pests. So we use a survey set as a way to to you know container all the work that's expected to be done within one route. So I'm going to create a new survey set and we get some interesting options here. So what I'm going to call this is um, this is going to be um, fruit fly 2020 and um, training subgrid type. This is a very important step for the counties. Um, when you're creating a survey set, all the pests that you're detecting for must operate off the same uh, subgrid system if you're grouping them together. You could set up a bunch of different survey sets if you want. One is for quint subgrids, one's for three by three, one's by four by four. But we don't have trappers going out in the field and, and mixing and mashing in a given day. They have to be working off of one kind of density system throughout the day. So if you're putting traps, if you're if you're going out on you know route 19-44 and you're trapping in quints, you're only doing quints. You're not doing three by three or four by four or five by five. You're just doing quints. So I'm going to pick the quint subgrid system and in the back end, so when we configure a county, we're going to take in all the pests that you detect for 
and the trapping parameters. So, okay, you do, you know, um, for example, you do gypsy moth, uh, Japanese beetle, maybe that's based off of a one by one mile grid or a, um, a three by three, four by four, five by five. We're gonna enter in all that data. When you pick Quint, for example, you're only gonna be able to create surveys that operate off the Quint um, system. So when I hit next, I now see the different pests that we've entered in the application under the Quint system. So this Kevin, list, Kevin. yeah. Um, when you're uh, determining the, the set, the survey set, for, so for example, you're doing it for a station, can you vary that between the route within that station? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I I couldn't quite hear the uh, yes. full, full question. I'm going to turn yes. up my my sound. Yeah, sorry, my my apparently my mic's not working very well. Um, it within a station area, if you've selected a survey set, must that apply to the entire station, or can it vary between the routes within that station? Uh, for example, if uh, let's say the entire area is trapped for medfly, medfly, off mel, gypsy moth, and Japanese beetle, but only two of uh, six routes also do like on apple moth. Yep. So okay, so you can you can customize it to that level. Yeah. So so uh, when you create. Um, Let's see. So yeah, when you create a survey, you can pick whole county, station, or grid. As long as the same subgrid system is used, you can use different areas in each one of your surveys. The trapper application will pick up the fact that, okay, I've got only two grids to do of this specific pest in this survey set. So they don't all have to overlap, for example. OK, uh, since we couldn't see the drop downs, I didn't know that there was a grid uh, selection. Yeah, yeah, that that's a that's it seems to be some sort of um, screen share issue with teams. Um, unfortunately, teams is the best option, especially when tomorrow we'll be demoing from the iPad, the iPad uh, you really need teams to um, screen share from there. Uh, hopefully we won't have that issue on the iPad. I, 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 I'm hoping it's a Windows only thing. But yes, you're right. I could, so I'm creating a survey right now um, and you know I'm gonna fill out some parameters here. I'm gonna do the Mediterranean fruit fly um, and I'm gonna enter a survey name. And I have a start date and an end date. So I can pick um, whatever corresponding dates uh, that, that apply to the season. Um, the, so the pest type, this is a drop down. You can't see the drop downs, which I really don't like. Uh, but you, now every time I pick a different quint based pest, we see different details about that pest. So we see what type of trap it needs. We see what the trap density is. So one per subgrid means that we have to do one, uh, one McPhail trap uh, baited for Mexican fruit fly per quint in order for the application to be happy and to say you've met your density requirements. One thing that we've allowed um, the administrative team to do is so it brings in the default uh, for, um, service intervals. So you can override those here. So you can come in and, and you can say, well, OK, we have a default in the database that works most of the time, but I have a chance if I want to override those dates. These these uh, number of days 
uh, David, are the are that that is the mechanism or part of the mechanism that that changes those traps to different colors every night based on um, you know one of these dates being lapsed. I'm going to go ahead and create a survey. Kevin, on that, um, can you actually uh, inspect the trap early, or will it? You that. You can absolutely uh, inspect a trap early, so uh, you can perform any activities that you want on a trap at any given point. Um, we use the map symbology as a way to uh, work as a visual indicator. So, you know, when you're driving down the street or when you're panning around, you can see that I have a cluster of orange and red up here. I should probably go deal with those. Um, but yeah, nothing is going to prevent anyone from inspecting a trap or collecting samples or anything like that. Um, uh, you know, you know, um, um, yeah, you can do that at any point. And then the application, we log all that activity with dates and times, and then we'll that will push out the next service interval by two weeks or by you know, the relocation frequency by a month or six weeks or, or whatever it is configured. So I've created a survey. Kevin, um, this is Bonnie. Yeah. I had a question on the values that are input into the inspection frequency and relocation frequency. Um, yeah. What values are unacceptable for a county to put in? If they put in a zero or a one, um, you know, in their effort to customize what they're doing. Yep. Some of the rural counties do things very differently. OK, so if you put in a zero, um, I believe that we will just not do validation on that. So it's going to be up to pre. Do you know? Do you know uh, for certain? Yeah, so there are I, I think the Japanese beetle, for instance, only has inspection frequencies and the other two are zero. So when it comes to validation, we we just presume this is the only type of service that can be performed on these traps and then we ignore the zero ones. OK, great. So zero is an acceptable value. Yeah. OK, uh, can I ask one other question? Yep. Um, and this actually was back on the vehicle uh, creation, but it could apply to all the other pop-up forms. Are there indicators of required fields on these pop-up dialogues? Um, if you save, if you click save, you will see the required. But um, you know what? Very valid point. We can put this as part of UAT feedback. If uh -huh. you would like to have, you know, stars there or something, we can absolutely do that. I think that would be helpful if it's easily doable. That would help with a general, very large rollout across the state. Awesome. So we'll yeah. we'll focus on that through the UAT period. We won't. Um, so we'll we'll pick up that conversation with you um, uh, after. Okay, Bonnie. You bet. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Uh, right, where was I? So we have a survey created. Um, so I can add, you know, I can add a bunch of different surveys to that survey set. Um, what I would like to do now is create a route for that survey uh, set. So this is a, a, a fantastic tool that's going to be the, like the heart and the heart and soul of some of this trapping stuff is creating routes itself and it's a fun tool to use it you get to do some color you know color code clicking and it looks quite nice so i'm working in the um, west um, um, station and i'd like to create a route so i'm gonna um, create a route and i know that there are certain um, different naming conventions this one uh, 19 is i, I believe LA County's county number, and we'll just call this route 76. I'm going to pick what station this route is in. So it's in the south state. Uh, whoops, it's in the west station. Uh, and then I get to pick the survey set. So the survey set is what we just created in the last step, and that's going to be an aggregate of different pests that we're going to uh, um, be detecting for. So I did uh, fruit fly 2020 training. I'm going to pick that. 
And now what we get to do is we get to create the route by using books. What we see here is we see this, this panel of different colors. I understand that some counties only use four books. Some use different number of books. So this is something that's configurable, um, you know, and, and essentially it will just hide book five, or if you only use three books, it'll hide book four and five. But you use this tool to digitize what the routes currently are um, within your county. So you can click book one. And so I have, you know, I've clicked on book one here where my mouse is, and then I click within different grids. And this adds a one by one mile grid to the route. So I'm happy with book one. I can go ahead and work my way through digitizing the route um, by using this book selector tool. So it's a pretty large route. I'm happy with it. Um, uh, I can do things like, OK, so I've added a square down here and it's book five, but I don't want it. So all I have to do is click on it again and it removes it. Or I can say, OK, book one, um, I'm going to change the red, which was book two to book one. So it's, it's a very flexible tool. Um, that allows you to basically toggle the different books. Very, you know, pick your book and click is essentially um, uh, how this tool um, is designed. So um, I have an option to add a trapper bulletin. This is, uh, this could be notes that uh, a trapper sees on their device when they, when they um, pick the route. So they can see some notes that a supervisor has put in and and you know I, I can't necessarily think of a, of a of a use case off the top of my head but maybe you just want uh uh your you know inspectors to be you know warned about something or um maybe it's it's work notes so you know only uh, complete book two uh and uh book three for example so um you know, this this is just another area that supervisors can communicate to uh, trappers with. So I'm going to go ahead and save this route. And now the route has been saved. It has a purple outline. Um, if we zoom out a little bit, we can see it better and we can see our 19-76 um, label. Within the manage routes tool, I can modify the route. So the route, uh, the modify route tool is going to ask me to pick which survey set I want to work on, and then it's going to show me which route I can edit. So I click on 19-76. The, the map, uh, um, when I selected it for the first time, the map zooms in or it, it centers that route on the screen. I can hit next, and now I'm right back into that um, uh, right back into that form. I can change the notes. So these notes, these trapper bulletins can be changed um, daily, if you will, will. And then in the morning when the when the inspector um, starts their, their mobile application, they'll be able to see what was written here. So um, this little filter tool, it just hides adjacent books. So you can more easily identify the route that you're working on because in a in a real world scenario, the whole map is going to be filled with routes. So it can be a little bit challenging to see, you know, the, the borders between the two. And we we just thought this was a a, a handy um, toggle to have that would would help. So you can come in and you can add more or you can remove some, um, whatever you want to do. So I've updated my route. And it's saved. Um, we can deactivate routes. So again, we're going to pick which route we want to deactivate by going through the survey set. And you can deactivate routes, but you cannot deactivate routes if they're assigned 
to anyone. So you have to unassign uh, individuals first, and um, I'll show the assign routes tool next so we can see what that looks like. So I'm going to skip over a few of these tools. We'll come back and take a look at these. I'm going to go to the assignment tab here, and I'm going to click on the assign route tool. So uh, I want to assign my 19-76 route. Um, of course, many of you will have tons of routes in here, so we have a nice filter tool that you can use. You can just click on the one you want. And this will allow you to assign a route to one or more uh, individuals. So I can come in and say this route is going to be worked on by two people. Maybe you have a rover that's coming in to help for the day. And the rover, maybe you put a trapper bulletin in there that says, you know, I would like uh, the rover to do to start on book four and work backwards towards uh, book three, where Bonnie will be completing. Uh, um, you know, um, trapping, and once Max is there, you know, call it a day. Um, so you can assign to multiple um, um, users like this, and you hit simply hit save, and our route assignment has updated successfully. And here we can see the two different um, individuals who have been assigned to work on that route. So the assign route tool. It's just a one. It's a one-click tool that opens up. Uh, it shows you your county stations. Because I'm an admin, I can I can manage the routes for the whole county. Some users may only see their specific station depending on what permissions you've set up. So there are like multiple different layers of permission built into this application. Um, so for example, if something doesn't seem right you want to verify that your user has the proper station permissions uh, assigned to them. If you're someone who, who should be uh, operating within the whole county, make sure that your user hasn't been set up with uh, one station, for example. All right. Uh, oh, I, did someone want to speak? Yeah, I had a question. Uh, will this work with... Uh for if you have like a delimitation, because that has two different types of, you know, the, the core would be a subgrid and then the buffers would be pointed. So, uh, so Dan, your question was, will this work with delimitation? Yeah. So we have, uh, Bonnie, did you want to answer that one? I um, sorry, it was very difficult for me to hear Dan's question. Oh, it was basically just will this work with de delimitation? Um, and I, I I touched on it earlier, but uh, the delimitation use cases aren't part of the initial scope of the initial rollout. So, you know, we could consider this the phase one rollout um, delimitation specific tools and use cases. Uh, are, are planning to be added to the application. Okay, right. and uh, my other question was, um, if you have state and county entities trapping in the county, would the state have a different station? Is that how that gets broken up or? I'm, I'm really sorry, sorry Dan. I, I couldn't really catch the main part of that question. I would be happy to. So, I break that up by station. I think Dan's question, think is, Dan's about question is about counties and counties state and programs trapping in the same area. Is that right, Dan? Yes. That's correct. Yeah, so the if the county is split into different grids, um, that the county um, handles versus the state, that will be possible. Okay. Thanks. But then Thanks. I wouldn't be, would that be like the stations then? Or like a, the county would have a, or the state would have a different station than the county? 
I mean, um, if Dan, if the if the if there's no overlap, so if it's completely two disparate disjoint uh, areas, I would suggest that the county have their own. Uh, or, or, so the state would have their own application that is is filtered down to what they need to see, and then the county have an application which is filtered down to what they need to see. And I mean, the, the data is all available. We can create, you know, viewer type applications outside of, you know, outside of the actual Caltrap admin stuff. But we can break up, you know, we can break up areas however we want. So you could do like a joint kind of um, custodial uh, application where you have state and local um, supervisors working in the same application here and you just have a handshake agreement and, and permissions that say, well, we're working in West and you're working in Central. Or you could break that, you could actually break West out into its own application and Central out into its own application as well. and from a management perspective, maybe that's better too. So it, you know, there's a lot of flexibility with with the different ways that this could be uh, uh, set up for a situation like that. Okay, cool. That uh, that makes sense. Awesome. Um, I'm gonna move along yep. to some of the. Kevin, uh, yes. Before you move along, um, yeah. uh, what about? This, this does go to Zealand, so it's, it's not in this application, but it's something to think about. Is that can uh, the state and a county uh, in an area where the detection program is is uh, run uh, by the county under contract, can they both independently um, have routes covering the same grids? Because if you had a Zealand. Uh, for a particular pest, the state's going to come in, operate that DLM, uh, and the grids may be under a different subgrid system than the county's operating the detection program in those same grids um, because they're not, they're not, uh, um, the county's not giving up those grids entire to the state during the DLM just as a trap uh, for the relevant pest. Yeah, I, 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 go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and, and uh, you know, if, if we're both using the same program and you can't use it in two different ways, that you know, simultaneously, that, that would be interesting. Yeah, so that use case should be supported. Now, when it comes to delimitation, as, uh, as I said, uh, it, we don't have any delimitation specific use cases covered in the application. You might be able to shoehorn um, some delimitation in, but I know that the different buffers, the different densities, the kind of spiraling out densities are not really supported and not it's not meant to be supported at this stage. But you could absolutely have two different surveys operating on top of each other with two different routes, um, and each of those uses a different uh, grid system that's that is supported right now. So I think I think we're we're most of the way there. Um, it might just be having that specific delimitation use case covered that um, would you know fully satisfy what what you just uh, said there. Okay. Yeah. Just just you know to be in mind as the next phase gets developed. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Uh, Next, we have the Manage Grids tool. Um, now, Manage Grids allows us to um, merge one by one mile grids together um, for, and this will affect pests that are being trapped off those one by one mile grids. So um, I'm going to go ahead and merge grids using the Merge Grid tool. And I can select a grid. It's going to zoom me in. Um, and I can basically just keep selecting grids as I want to merge them together and hit save. So this is one, this is this is another thing that, you know, um, trapping staff will need to digitize in anywhere that they have merged uh, grids. We see a blue outline here. 
Um, so you know, I do I do know that the the map is quite uh, the map is quite busy. Um, so let's see. I was just going to try to cl clean it up a little bit to see if we could see that a bit uh, uh, a bit better. Unfortunately, this is we get what we get here. We might look at thickening up some lines if if um, through UAT it's hard to see this, but um, this is part of the digitization process. Um, we have a tool that can modify the merged grid. So if I want to add some more grids to it or remove grids, and I can also unmerge a grid entirely. So here's the merged grid. I can go ahead and break that apart. Um, and it, it essentially removes it, putting those grids back to normal. I have the same option with subgrids. Now we only um, have the ability right now to merge quints. This was something that was um, discussed with the uh, working group. I can go ahead. So when I when I launch this tool, you'll see that we have many different um, subgrid systems visible. What we've tried to do in the application is when you want to deal with one type of grid, we're going to filter the map down. So right now we can only see that quint subgrid system in here. It's a bit easier to see here. It's this uh, orange line. Um, so I can go ahead and merge subgrids. So I'm going to pick quint uh, and I can pick more quints to add and I can save that um, like that and then again you can see that blue boundary um, kind of easier to see when you're zoomed out but that'll affect density whenever that um, uh, whenever that grid is trapped on a quint uh, uh, or an insect requiring um, quint subgrid type we have, um, oh, I'm just checking, I'm just checking the chat to make sure I haven't uh, missed anyone. I think uh, Dan might have, you might have your hand raised from before. Let me know if you have a, another question. Um, we can manage sites. So as I said earlier, the sites are, um, I'm gonna turn off, turn off the subgrids here so we can see a little better. So sites are uh, the parcels, and we're going to convert that to a trapping site by adding some information about it. So, um, um, I'm going to zoom in on the map and find the parcel that I'm interested in. I can hit create single site, and I can uh, it says uh, click select parcel button below, and then click on a parcel that will be used for the trapping site. So I'm going to make uh, this one a trapping site here. I can see some hosts out front. So this is going to go ahead and select the parcel. It's going to bring in some parcel details about the um, uh, parcel I clicked on. What's the um, AIN number? What's the address, uh, city zip code? So these are things that for your county based on um, your base data sets. We may have to modify this tool just a little bit to work with different parcel data sets, but that's completely uh, what we envision and how, how we envision integrating um, everyone's data. So site details. Um, this is information about the site. By default, we put the address in here, but maybe you want to say, you know, this is... Um, I should have picked a better business name, but um, you, you can change that in uh, that site name to be something that's like a little bit maybe more descriptive. Um, you can pick from the um, site type selector. So this is a drop down here. And I have airport, commercial, industrial, orchard and residential types. These are all configurable types that that uh, counties can specify which ones they work with. So I'll pick commercial. Um, I see that the chat is active. Can you merge quints from a, di uh, okay. Okay, so I have two questions. So how do you address a mobile home park with many individual site spaces? So I'll get there 
next with the uh, the next part of this tool, which is the multi-site tool. Um, so that was from Nolan uh, Nielsen. And uh, Dana Richmond says, uh, or asks, can you merge quints from different grids? So, so you cannot, you, you must merge quints inside that are that are that are inside of one by one mile grid so you can't uh, uh, you can't operate outside of that that boundary um, hopping back over to my tool um, I have a permission drop down there's two options in here permission denied permission given so I'm going to hit permission given and then the form expands and there's some uh, information that more information that I can fill out. I can put in some details. Um, I should also mention that this tool, this is a special tool because it's also available on the Trapper application. So, um, uh, so this Trapper application or the Trapper application will get this tool as well. It, it looks identical. I mean, the way that iOS does it is a little bit different, but ultimately you're going to have inspectors out there that are creating sites. So we'll cover this tool tomorrow again uh, in the mobile viewer, um, but works the same way uh, and both admins and and uh, inspectors have that have that tool. So is viable is an important checkbox um, viable basically means is there an acceptable host on this site so if it's non-viable maybe the site uh, maybe there's a fire at the site and everything got destroyed unfortunately you can now mark that site as as non-viable um so uh, that essentially removes it from your view the the inspectors don't really need to worry about that site anymore it's not an, an acceptable host there's a has dog indicator this is a very important checkbox if the inspector knows that there's a dog at the location checking this box will add a, a visual indicator to the map i can also add some notes access notes might be gate code is five 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 six um, um so uh this is a place for for people to share details Maybe it's a different inspector going there next time. They need to know that, OK, I got to go around the backyard. Here's the gate code. Here's some different information uh, about that. So I'm going to go ahead and save. I see a question that came in from uh, Chang. And um, can you reorganize site type list for residential first? So yeah, this is you know some great feedback we're, we're collecting here. Um, I would. I, I think it would be best to um, pass some of this feedback on to Bonnie uh, and her team. They're going to be managing all the UAT feedback and and assessing ultimately uh, and prioritizing um, um, different items. So please um, pass it on to Bonnie. Bonnie, is that OK? I, I guess we haven't really yeah, talked formally yeah. about the UAT process yet, but. No problem. No problem. I'm, taking I'm taking screenshots, screenshots here. here. Awesome. Awesome. So I've saved this site and we can see that there's a little dog icon here. So that is a special icon that appears um, as a visual cue that there's a dog and, and um, the inspector should be uh, careful. The next tool that, well, I'll, I'll go back into manage sites um, briefly here. And this is that site group tool I was talking about. I will go into that tool um, in a little bit here. I'm also just going to demonstrate the modify site tool. So I can click on a site. Oops. I can initiate my tool, click on a site. And what we see here is we get the same form again. Uh, we can make some changes. Um, maybe there's new, new people living there and there's no more dog. I can go ahead and re remove that dog um, or change contact details. I'll jump over to manage hosts and then we'll go back to the, the, the mobile home park with many individual site spaces. So manage host tool, this is adding and removing hosts, trees. Um, 
the tools are we tried to build them in a way that they're quite similar to one another so when you're whether you're adding sites or adding or managing hosts everything should kind of have the same feel so because i can see here on my um, uh, aerial imagery layer i can see where the host is um, i have an option to see some site details after i clicked on the host location maybe i clicked the wrong spot and i can try to click again um, if i click outside you know i haven't been i've been taking the happy path in this application um, but there are quite a few validation steps and I'm not covering everything. For example, I can't add a host if it's not on a um, on a site. So I just clicked on the middle of the road and it's basically saying that you need to create a, a location here first, create a trapping site before you can put a host there. So I'm going to go ahead and digitize this tree. I have different categories. This is a drop down. This is all configurable. Uh, from the county level as well. So here's a drop down of different tree categories. I see berries, common fruit trees, less common fruit trees, nut trees, ornamental structure and vegetables. I'm going to pick common fruit trees. And here's another drop down, a type that becomes enabled once you pick the category. So it's it's a, a, a nested selection. Here I can go in and I can pick. Well, that is a cherry tree. I'm going to save this. New host successfully added. And now we can see a red dot where that cherry tree was or where that where that cherry tree is. Earlier I clicked on the map. So on different features, we've enabled the map click. So you can just click on things to learn about them. Again, during uh, UAT, um, uh, during UAT we can uh, uh, you know, if, if any changes need to be made to the details about um, what's clicked on and what appears when you do that, we can make some changes there. Uh, Kevin? Anna Maria, yes? Uh, 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 yes, it is. No, notice how the boundaries of that parcel, and then there appears to be a canary island palm tree right out of the parkway. Yep. If you click on that, that's not going to be associated with that property, is it? It's not. That's problematic. OK, that's that's uh, that's some good uh, feedback. We, we use street trees for things a lot, you know, for gypsy moss traps, for like on apple moss, um, you know, for doing uh, palm wavel survey. And, you know, generally we consider the parkway in front of a residence you know, or, or a partial property to be part of that property. Certainly the people at that location consider. OK, De definitely noted, um, definitely noted uh, on our side. Pre can you just take a brief note about that? We'll want to we'll want to talk with the working group uh, and dig into that one a little bit more. Sounds good. Uh, thank you. Thank Oh, and that so that pretty much I think uh, was the same question that we had in the chat from Anna Maria as uh, Anna Maria Nistor as well. Um, so yes, it looks like this is uh, you know um, an important item, and we will uh, work to figure out how to how to best address that um, in the application. In manage hosts, we also have modify hosts. I don't really need to go into too much detail, but you can draw a little box around the trees. We use a box tool when you're selecting points because it's easier to pick the tree that you want instead of um, clicking uh, with a point. If you pick multiple trees, we show you a list. Did you want to edit the cherry tree or did you want to edit the uh, spruce tree, for example? Um, we can deactivate the tree and we can also move the tree. So maybe there's a mistake. Someone somewhere put the tree on the wrong side of the property you can come in and you can relocate that host as well. And that's just a data cleanup um, tool. So uh, the inspectors have the best uh, data at their fingertips possible. Uh, all right, multi-site tool. So this is the trailer park uh, example. And 
what I can do is I think I think this mall parking lot probably I don't know exactly where a trailer park or mobile home uh, um, are, homes are, but I, I can use this uh, example here and we can kind of select some cars or select some parking spaces. So in the manage sites tool, I can create a site group. So I'm going to select the overarching area. So the, the you know the mobile home park would be would have a master parcel. I'm going to select that and now I get to draw a site in using the site tool. So I can digitize in different sites um, within that parcel and each one could potentially have different contact information. So this tool allows uh, um, the application to work in a manner like um, that supports the use case of many different properties on, on one master uh, property. There is minor differences. We have the site group. So the site group, I mean, you could call this like So Sunset Home to Venice, um, you can pick the site type. It's this really the same form uh, that the other one was except for the site group. And then you can go ahead and um, pre, I believe you can modify. I'm going to type in Sunset Homes of Venice. I can come in here. And add in more as many as I want. So that is uh, that's how that uh, is handled. Just like so. Um, all right, so we have half an hour left. This is awesome. We are probably going to have a few minutes left over for some questions and discussions. I want to show everyone the reporting capabilities of the application. So we built the application. Uh, we had some reports specced out for us from the working group, and we've been able to build that into the application. Uh, Preet, we talked earlier. Can you just remind me for a daily trapping report, which trapper has data for which date? So there's Caltrap Tester B, which is the only one who's worked, and okay. they have for 6th of the August. OK. OK, August 6th, and I can pick. Uh, uh, um, which day? We're just looking, we're just looking for some work here. Let me uh, check in the data quickly. OK, OK. Uh, looks like there should be some work for the sixth. Um, okay, could it could it be which which um, station is uh, this this trapper in? Let me uh, look at that. Okay. Okay, so this tester user is a field staff type or sorry manager for south oh i see is this is this a is this a, a filtering thing going on i believe so i'm going to do a quick permission update here okay So just for the, the folks on the call, we might have hit a, just a little snag um, with permissions. We're going to make sure that you know any 
anything like that, we're going to uh, understand what permission might be blocking us. We're going to verify that. Is it correct? It doesn't look like it's correct, and then we can make a modification based on that. Um, so just bear with us while we get the uh, uh, application in a state where we can bring some uh, trapping data out of it, and I'll show all of the different reports. In fact, I think while Preet's making some changes, um, I should be able to run the flat file report. So this, yes. this report is um, uh, submitted to, oh, I, is it C, the CDFA or, I'm USDA. sorry, Bonnie. USDA, thank you. Um, I can pick a start date for this report and it's gonna basically output all the data after that date. Or, uh, let's see. Okay, so I've opened up another, uh, uh, I've opened up another um, tab here. I'm gonna share that I'm going to share that tab one moment. So we downloaded the flat file report, and this is a, a data dump um, of all the trapping activities that have that's happened since um, uh, the date that I picked. So we were provided a format that we had to build and spec this report to, and this is this is essentially it. So lots of fields. Some of the fields are blank, but we are um, um, working on this to uh, a, a design spec. And this is going to take all the data um, out of the application. This this could be a very large report. So that's one of the reports that we uh, have created. I'm going to jump back over. And all right, Preet, is is it ready for me to try again? Yeah, let's try uh, daily trapping for 6th of the August and Caltrap test should be. OK. OK, perfect. So uh, yeah, we just uh, we just potentially identified a little permissions um, issue that uh, will we'll get fixed up um, uh, as soon as possible. So the daily trapping report is a report that uh, essentially summarizes what someone has done for each day. Uh, this application has built in filtering. So when we clicked on this before, we couldn't see any um, uh, logs down below um, due to due to permissions. But now we can click on one and um, we'll see what kind of report is generated for route 19-43. It's going to collect the three work logs. And it's going to build us a daily report. So um, here we have some uh, uh, details about what uh, our our B tester performed on that day, um, the different trap types that were um, um, in use, serviced, relocated total. Um, again, we built this out to uh, a spec that was provided to us. Um, uh, and yeah, so you'll have flexibility as a supervisor to go and pull reports and generate them on the fly. You saw how fast this data was generated. So everything's done on demand uh, for reporting, and that's, we think you get the best information, uh, um, you know, the most accurate information that way, instead of doing things um, and storing them in, in a database, uh, uh, in a summary table. I can do weekly trapping report as well. And for the weekly trapping report, um, I can pick a start date and an end date. So by default, it's going to it's going to go back a week, um, uh, but you can configure these dates as you want. And again, I can pick what which um, route I want and uh, I can generate the report. And this one's going to show a little bit less detail. Uh, 
Oh, the other, the other, I guess the, um, the other one might actually be a better one to pick here. So here, pick 19-43. It looks like the weekly trapping report is essentially the daily trapping report, but it just summarizes a date range. And it also shows all the different routes uh, or the different route and the different books that were worked on that week, total hours, um, total od odometer information, um, different uh, roll up there. Gonna go to the monthly activity report and let's compile Seven. a report. Yeah. Um, on that, uh, if you can go back to that prior screen. Would you, uh, should I bring up the report? Yeah. Okay. Since, uh, since that's showing uh, multiple days, what happens if somebody used more than one vehicle during that time frame? Preet, how does how does the report handle multiple vehicle scenario? Yeah, so we did bring it up uh, when we were building it um, in in our development sessions, and as uh, as a team, we all agreed on that to not include that vehicle information in in that case. So uh, there wouldn't be any odometer readings and vehicles um, or miles driven for for that uh, scenario if there are multiple vehicles used. So the, the assumption if you didn't see that information so then that, that multiple vehicles. Could, could uh, uh, pre. Uh, no, a great point. Uh, that was, was that David? Yeah. Preet, would we be able to uh, just put a note that says um, multiple vehicles used? Yeah, definitely can. Oh, OK, uh, just just put a note down for that. I I, I think that, um, you know, uh, with that note on on the report would just help quite a bit with um, understanding the data. Yeah, that sounds good. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for that feedback. Sure. All right, uh, back to the monthly report. Let's generate a report for August. Um, Preet, can you remind me which station here I should pick? Uh, it should be in North. North, okay. So again, there's some drop downs here. We had month uh, and station drop downs. I'm gonna go ahead and generate the report. And again, we have, um, uh, the roll up report here. So, you know, these reports, there are some header information. These things will be customized. Uh, you know, we can we can customize some um, standard information or some some header information for each of the different counties. That's again, totally expected as uh, uh, for for our rollout activities. So um, these will all be little things that we work with uh, individuals uh, on on customizing. So where does that leave us? Um, pre, I think, did I miss anything here? I'm just looking at my agenda. I think we've covered all of the admin functionality. Yes, that's right. Okay, awesome. So we do have 20 minutes left. Um, are there any questions relating to any of the functionality that we saw here? I will be providing the recording to the working group and, and then it can be um, uh, passed around. I'm going to uh, just end the recording now. One moment.